Hi again, folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us today. Glad you could tune in. And now, as one of our listeners mentioned in one of the uh, social media comment sections, this podcast really is a bit more broad. Our focus isn't strictly real estate property investment in Japan, simply because we believe that there are many topics that actually tie into the bottom lines of investments here. So we do occasionally talk、uh, general business, economy, even social issues at times, and most definitely about many other things that are related to Japan's real estate property arena. So things which can and usually do tie into real estate property investment, either directly or indirectly. And tonight's interview is a case in point again with us on the line from Osaka is Tom Legg, originally from the UK. Now, Tom, who's been living in Japan for the past five and a half years, Is currently living with his wife Yuko in a,、uh, to quote from his blog, perfectly nice, modern, but small rented apartment in the center of Osaka. Now, that blog is amazingly insightful. It's called the Osaka House Project. And Tom and Yuko have, since mid 2016 or so, been feeling what many of us here in Japan often feel, which is a yearning for more space. So that's really a very common feeling for many of us,、uh, especially the foreigners here. Who are used to larger living arrangements in our country of origin, or again, as he beautifully puts it,、um, space that just cannot be found in the center of the city unless you're a hedge fund manager or happen to own a park. Space to have a barbecue in the summer without fear of setting the neighbor's apartment on fire, space to sit outside without having to reposition all of the、uh, washing on the balcony, space to cure and smoke bacon on an industrial scale. I love that one, Tom. Space to、uh, perhaps work or run a business from home, space for some kids to run around, etc. etc. So, having started the search for these、um, suitable properties,、uh, this young couple who are aged 29 and 31 have quickly come to the conclusion that what they really want is not an existing home, which might be new but sort of cookie cutter modern Japanese style with all that that entails. Or even an older Japanese style house that'll probably require a whole lot of work to bring up to their standards, if that's even possible. But I think at this point, we'll let Tom take over and maybe explain a bit about the journey that they've been on. Tom, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. It's awesome to have you here on the show. Hi,、um, great to be here. Thank you for having me. So, first, before we get right into the、uh, house project story, Can you maybe tell us a bit more about yourself, the origin story, so to speak? So, how did you end up in Japan? What do you do here?、Um, how did you and your wife end up together? Just a little bit of that.、Um, yes, so as you said, I've been living here for about five and a half years now.、Um, I'm originally from the UK.、Um, and before I was in Japan, I was working in London for a few years、um, in the finance sector predominantly. Um, and I decided I wanted a career change and to do something different, and I like to travel.、Um, so, like many foreigners here, I came to work as an English teacher.、Um, I started on the JET program working in Hiroshima, Hiroshima Prefecture, in the east part of the prefecture, in kind of a smallish, a、well, pretty small town, I would say.、Um, and I worked there for two years working at a senior high school,、um, which was a fantastic experience.、Um, and... Decided that I like teaching, but also during that time I, I met my now wife.、Um, and、um, from that point on,、um, decided that I really liked、uh, Japan, but wanted to move beyond sort of the small town lifestyle、um, and go to, to work in a, in a bigger city, I guess.、Um, so I finished working at the high school and took a job with the British Council. Um, now, when I was working at the British Council,、um, I was charged with setting up their office in Osaka, which、uh, closed last year.、Um, but because the office wasn't set up, I actually had to go and live in Tokyo、um, for the first six months.、Um, so I looked on a map and <coughs> excuse me, was,、um, was trying to work out where to live in Tokyo. I'd spent a little bit of time there before, but really didn't have much of an idea.、Um, And I was looking on the map and I thought, well, Minatoku, that looks like a good place to live.、Um, I didn't realize at the time that Minatoku was quite so expensive.、Um, and I went online and I rented a monthly mansion, which seemed like a reasonable price、um, because I knew I was only going to be there for six months.、Um, and when I arrived in Tokyo, I saw sort of the details of this monthly mansion. It was 11 square meters.
55 years, 55 years old and uh, was situated above quite a smelly falafel shop. Um, but it was in the best district in Tokyo and it was a great place to live. I didn't have to commute in on the train from Saitama or anything like that. I could really enjoy living in the center of Tokyo. Um, but that really was a proper small, you know, tiny apartment Japan experience. Um, and my wife was actually, she was in, was not my wife then, but she was in Ireland at the time doing a working holiday. Um, so I wasn't quite sure when she was going to come back. So when it came down to moving to Osaka to, to start the office and start this job, um, originally I envisaged living by myself. Um, and as it happened, my wife came back from the working holiday a little bit earlier. So I had just rented quite a small apartment um, in Osaka, which I expected to live in by, my, by myself. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of months later, and, and my, my wife was living with me. So that was ooh, three and a half years ago now. And when, you, so, when you say small, how small are we talking about for the uh, couple yeah, apartment? It's sort of a 1DK. It's about 35 square meters or so. So, so great for one person, certainly. And it's right in the center of Olstaka. Um, but, you know, when you, when you add in another person and sort of two sets of clothes and a big fridge and all those sorts of things, you start kind of running out of space a little bit. Mm. Um, and I think probably after about a year of that or so, that's when I started sort of noticing that I really didn't have enough space. Um, and as I began to think sort of more long term um, about living in Japan, um, I started to think more seriously about possibly buying property here um, as, a, as a longer term, not, not an investment, but as a place to live in. Um, and my wife, I think... Well, I'm from the UK, so so we kind of, the bricks and mortar thing is a big part of our culture. It's something that we really want to get on the property ladder. We want to buy somewhere, somewhere we can call our own home, for example. Um, but I think my wife wasn't quite ready for that. But we did go and start looking at some properties together. Um, and the original plan was to go and have a look at an older property and renovate. Because um, we figured that was probably the best way of getting sort of a larger larger house i say we it was me at this stage yeah. um and actually the first one and i think I, I, i talked about this in the blog the first house that we went to look at was on this massive piece of land in the countryside in a place called shijonawate in uh, the outskirts of osaka um and this place was amazing i mean it was 600 square meters of land um had like a water wheel in the garden had an outside tea house i mean it was It was crazy. It was like a Ghibli house. It was really beautiful. Sounds like an onsen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually was a company retreat um, originally. Um, but it was kind of weird, and there was this big plot of land, and actually it was three properties, and they hadn't really drawn the boundaries, and it just looked like it was going to be such a huge amount of work. Um, so, yeah, we really liked that place, but we, we, we passed on that pretty quickly because we, we, it was the first place we looked at. I mean, it was such a huge project, and we really weren't sure what we were getting ourselves in for at that stage. Um, I went to see a couple more properties and was, you know, sort of more, as I said, sort of cookie-cutter type places, the small sort of Japanese kit houses. Um, and I, I wasn't especially inspired by that. Um, and they tended to be sort of newer properties as well. Um, and at that stage, I was really looking at Um, doing a renovation and, and, and buying a cheap old house um, to renovate and do up. And I went to go and see another one, another huge property actually, um, that was available. But again, it was quite a strange place. And I sort of you know, walked downstairs outside and had a look and there was this sort of huge pile of sand and earth and sort of old refrigerators and rubbish and all that sort of thing underneath the foundations of the house and they're all kind of bowed and stuff mm. um and so i asked the, the real estate agent how much he thought it would cost to to take that house down it was a concrete house um you know big house but he said it would cost about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to take that house down well for that price right um exactly and so I, I, I kind of got it into my head that sort of, you know, renovation was 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 perhaps not necessarily the sort of the, the cheapest, you know, it, I mean, in some cases, perhaps it might be, but not necessarily the way that I wanted to go. Hmm. Um, and then around that time, also, there was an earthquake, I remember, which happened. Um, and um, 
it got me looking at some of the regulations and things like that. Um, and I was a little bit worried about sort of, you know, earthquake safety and how much we might have to put into a property in order to make it safe, you know, not necessarily for ourselves, but if we have kids and things like that. Yeah. Um, so actually the, the huge house with all the appliances under it, that was actually the last property or sort of fixed renovation type property that we went to look at. Okay, so you look at all these properties and then you or both of you just realize that maybe that won't do or maybe there's better ways to spend your money or definitely ways that you know at least you're going to end up with something that you really want to live in and then you sort of what came to the conclusion that you want to build your own house um yes i think it was it was really you know looking at these properties and looking at the renovation um and then sort of getting quotes and talking to people for example and i think to get the sort of renovation that we wanted um, it was always going to be this huge task. Um, and when we started doing the figures for the sort of renovation that we wanted to do, it was coming out to about the same as it would be to to build the place or build a new place for ourselves. Um, and then I think we sort of got to thinking, well, if we start from scratch, then we can have within budget, of course, exactly what we want. Um, and we don't have to make these compromises sort of left, right and center. Um, so I kind of, I guess that's how we decided we, we wanted to build something for ourselves and start from, from scratch. Right. I mean, it, it does make perfect sense, doesn't it? I'm sure there's a lot of uh, listeners out there that are now coming or maybe have already come to that same conclusion, but it still must be a bit of a scary thought, no? For someone, especially from a different country, uh, maybe at that time, maybe not super fluent in Japanese or definitely not in Japanese real estate terms, I would assume. I mean, the property Absolutely. search would have taught you some of that, but how did you even start? Um, well, I mean, the first thing is to find some land, um, which is easier said than done. Um, you, you spend a lot of time looking at portals and sort of often it's just a picture and, you know, you're trying to work out sort of sizes and locations to stations and all sorts of things like that. Um, and then, of course, when you look at the portals, you call up and find it's not available. Um, and the problem is, is that we didn't really know exactly where we wanted to build. Um, and Osaka is a big place. It's got lots of suburbs. It's got lots of areas where people are building houses. Um, so finding a space, finding somewhere that we wanted, and we kind of had too much choice and not enough at the same time. Right. Um, so, you know, we were looking for months and months and months trying to find something. Um, and there was this house that we that we'd seen, that we thought of as a possible renovation project. Um, and it was really cheap, and it came on a big parcel of land. And we kept passing it by because the house was, you know, looked awful. It was, it was run down, and it had this big sort of red corrugated iron, probably illegal shed attached to it. It was, it was really weird. Mm. Um, and I think it was just one week I was, I was bored. It was in an area that we were really looking at. Um, and I thought, well, I'm not doing anything. I'll go and have a look at it. Um, and the house, um, I was trying to weigh up exactly how much it would cost to knock it down. Remember having, having been told previously that, that a, a bigger house, but a concrete house, but you know, a house of similar-ish size had, would have been $150,000 to knock down. Um, and I was sort of playing it through in my mind and thinking how much it would cost. And I thought, well, the land is reasonably cheap, etc. cetera. Um, and then we looked at the paperwork and we found out that the owner of the house, um, he was a builder, and he was agreeing to knock it down as part of the deal. Yep, that happened um, a lot. Which, which I was a bit shocked by, to be honest. Um, and I suppose that turned a house, you know, and a, and a piece of land with a house on it into sort of a maybe, maybe not sort of financial prospect into actually that's now quite a serious prospect. Mm. Um, so we made some more inquiries about things like, uh, you know, septic tanks and sewerage and gas and things like that. And it was it was interesting because every time we approached this, um, we came up with sort of a best case, worst case scenario um, in terms of the cost, because this is, you know, ultimately you're just buying a pot of land. So the cost and the square meterage, et cetera, really, you know, the, the two things that you're focused on once you've decided the location is okay. Mm. Um, and once we... Once we'd realised that actually we were we were at the top end of these, as in as in the good end of all of these sort of you know worst case best case scenarios that we were looking at, um, actually the land became actually a really good deal. 
Um, and we got to the point whereby we decided actually we're going to put in an author. Um, at this stage, this is not a simple flat piece of land. This is a, a three-stepped um, up on a hill, um, you know, 280 square meters of which about 240 square meters is easy to build on and the rest is impossible to build on. So it's not an easy piece of land. It requires a bit of decision or stupidity or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> But also this plot of land, because I think, you know, it does have these issues associated with it. And it wasn't clear that the house was going to be knocked down. It had been on the market for quite a while. Um, so we put in an offer at about 25% below the afting, asking price as a sort of a starting point to start a negotiation. Yeah. And I got a call two days later from a pretty shocked estate agent saying they accepted it. Oh. Um, at which point my wife and I sort of looked at each other and said, well, what do we do now? Do we have to buy it? <laughs> um, like it's it's one of those things whereby if you don't, if you if you sort of throw in an offer without really really thinking too much about it and just saying well we'll start from here, then when it gets accepted, you kind of think well, did we did we really think this through? Um, but then we you know we decided to go ahead with it. We thought it was great, um, and then we realised we had to we had to build a house on it. Yep. Um, and I mean, how do you do that? It's 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 there's a, such a, a large amount of choice. There's hundreds of builders. Do you look at pictures? Do you go on reviews? Do you ask around? You know, what sort of area do you look at? Do you look at the district? Do you look at the city? Do you look at the suburb? Do you look at the whole city? Do you look outside the prefecture, for example? Um, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, is that point we realised. You know, we, we, we didn't really know what the best way to approach this was. Right. So builders, I mean, building companies usually also come with their own um, architect. I mean, maybe that, that's usually the first point where you start, right? So your own architect or the building company's architect. And that's kind of a, a major decision. How did you how did you approach that one? I mean, did, did you like weigh out the pros and cons or is it just, some, you know, price and creative freedom like in any other country? Is there maybe anything uniquely Japanese in those decisions? Well, the uniquely Japanese part, I don't know, because I've never done this before. Yeah. So um, I think we kind of just kind of guessed. We, we did put together a, a pros and cons list um, for, for having an architect. And we considered those two things as, as kind of the, the A or B option, right? You either take the architect and you, you deal with the architect, and then you use the building company once the designs are all done. Or you use a building company. And we, we sort of saw these as the two polar opposites. The problem was is that when we then put in the you know when made then made the pros and cons list, they were pretty equal on both sides. Um, so it didn't really help us all that much. Um, from 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 what I remember, when we were thinking of the pros of an architect, the first thing we thought was it was a genuinely bespoke house, um, kind of one of a kind, unique, etc. And you're not limited builders motives to push you in a particular direction to a design they've done before or to materials that they they know they can source at a big markup or something like that mm. um we also felt that if we use an architect we wouldn't be restricted to a single house builder or to particular specialisms we could start with what they want and then the architect could find us but then how does um, the price compare well the architects that we that we that we um, went to see um, he said that it's about 10% more expensive to use an architect. But the thing is, the people who use architects tend to build more expensive houses anyway. Right. They tend to use more bespoke materials. The more you seem to do custom stuff, the more it gets expensive very quickly. Um, so the architect's fees themselves would have been about 10% of the build cost, which is you know very considerable. Um, we, we did wonder whether or not by using a third party, as in using an architect, um, we would have more negotiating power with house builders and that those house builders would be more keen to do a good job because they would be likely to get more business from the architect who does many houses rather than just from us. Mm. Um, but we did distinctly get the impression that using an architect first would have been considerably more expensive, um, that it would have been very complicated, the design process, which some people might like, but it also takes a long time. Um, we felt that sort of maybe agonizing over minute details might be quite difficult. Um, we didn't know any architects. 
Um, and perhaps we might have less choice over who would ultimately build the house. Um, so we kind of weighed up those pros and cons. Um, and then we decided that we'd go and see um, some building companies and see some architects and then see if that was that would help us to make the decision. Um, and in fact, it did, but in a different way than I might have expected. Um, from, from going to meet the, the building companies and we had good experiences and we had bad experiences. I, I read about a, a, a not, not a terrible experience, but a sort of a very cultural difference between us and the building company, which happened on our, on our blog. Um, but what we realized through this process um, is that it wasn't so much the case of building company versus architect, for us at least. It was more about who were the people involved in the process. Um, and then after speaking to various sort of building companies, um, there was a building company that we went to see. We liked their houses. We liked what they did. We liked their ethics. We liked their ethos. But most importantly, we liked them as people. Um, and then when we realized that we'd found a building company that we actually liked, that part became much more important than perhaps the process by which you end up with a house. Right. Um, so because we liked these builds a lot, we felt comfortable with them. They could speak English, for example. That's why we ended up going with that company. So we kind of, I suppose, never really made the decision. <laughs> no, but I mean, you, that, that's exactly right. I mean, the relation, they always talk about how relationships are really important in Japan. And I think, especially if you're um, going into a project like this, and, and we're probably going to get into um, the many ways in which it can change along the road. So it's really important to be with people that you feel comfortable and people that you just trust, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, okay, so what happened next? Did they just show up one day and start building, like uh, as per the specs you decided on? Or are you even involved at all? How does it all work? Um, so in the in the first place, I mean, you'll you'll go and you'll meet them a couple of times. You'll talk in vague terms about what you want. Uh, you might go and see either if they have an open house somewhere or uh, you know building they've produced some 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 papers have mobile homes, for example. Um, but once you've decided that you're going to go with them, you pay a design fee or a holding deposit. I can't remember exactly what came first. Um, and then there's a series of meetings where you go into much more detail about what it is that you want. Um, and that's one of the things we liked about our builders is they asked us what we wanted and we could explain it in simple terms what we were looking for. Um, and it was us doing most of the talking. They would give advice when they needed to, but they listened to what we wanted, listened to things about our budget, for example, and then from that point on, from, from those first couple of meetings where we went through all of that, they went away and made a first design and produced a 3D model, for example, which a lot of them do. Um, and then that was us. We, we, we had then started the process. Um, and once that's done, uh, you come back, see the design they've made. There is, By the way, there is nothing more exciting than seeing your first house design. Yeah, I'd imagine. Um, yeah, the combination of all the conversations that you've had, talking to each other, could you do this, could you do that, and then finally you get to see it. Um, and at least in our case, it was a bit of an anti-climax because we kind of expected it was going to be this perfect, finished, right, sign on the dotted line and we're ready to go kind of thing. Um, but actually, invariably, and I've, I've read about this in other blogs, for example, the first design comes back and it's not what you want. Um, and that starts a dialogue and a conversation, and then there are relatively big changes, or at least in our case, relatively big changes that went into the second design. Um, and that was us saying, no, 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 this room must be bigger, the whole house has got to be taller, it's got to be this, you know, sort of macro scale changes. And, and they're okay with all of this, they're not giving you the feeling that you're, you're hassling them or that you're, you know, going outside the project scope or anything like that? Um, certainly not with our company. Okay. Um, the company that we're dealing with, it's one of the things we liked about them. It was a two-way dialogue. When they were pushing back on things, it's because they genuinely thought they had a better idea. Um, I didn't get the impression that they were trying to push us down one way or the other. They talked about things they'd done in the past, of course. Um, but I didn't feel that we were getting pushed into that sort of type A, type B, type C house. Yep. You know, choose from the piece of paper and then sign off and that's what you've got. Um, and there were pretty big changes for the second design. And the second design came back, I'd say, 90% what we were looking for. Um, and what we found, it's almost kind of like a triangle. You start with these really big changes to the design, big modifications, for example. And you get smaller and smaller and smaller as you near the top of the pyramid. Um, and 
you become more specific and then it's small changes. It's moving a door where it's changing, you know, the way a door opens or, or things like that. Um, and, you know, it becomes more and more and more manageable um, with the sort of smaller changes that you're making and you're kind of honing in on the, on the smaller design. And that's when things like wiring and plumbing and stuff come through. Um, that's when you start, you know, the process of actually clearing the site, you know, excavation and getting ready to build. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that our house plans are entirely finished because there's always going to be changes which have to happen along the way. We might change our mind about something. Um, but I would say that our house plans are at this stage about 95% finished. Um, then they start building and then you prefer, you know, get ready for the, for the other things which are going to happen along the way. If you've read the blog uh, recently, the wall fell down. Yes, um, I have read that. <laughs> that was actually going to be my next question. There's got to be some things um, along the way that are completely unexpected, right? And they, they, they would happen through the process of the building um, or clearing or demolishing if there's anything there to do. Like you say, a wall falling down, you find something in the ground that you have to build around or remove. Uh, how do you handle those situations financially and practically? Uh, well, I mean, firstly, you have to cross your fingers and hope it doesn't happen too much. Um, you know, you, you can mitigate a little bit. I mean, I, I, I said sort of kind of flippantly that the wall fell down, and it did, and it was unexpected that the wall... This is the, this is the wall with the neighbor's property, by the way. Mm. Um, but we knew it was likely that we were going to have some issues with the land because it was odd. It's on sort of three tiers. It was cheap. There was an old house on it. Um, in order to try and mitigate that somewhat... Um, we did some sort of tests, standard test things like sonar checks in terms of the soil quality, and they had identified that some of the land might potentially be an issue. Um, so I think a lot of this comes down to, in the first place, having good communication with builders, as you said. Um, you know, having an open conversation and builders being able to explain to you that this might happen, or it's possible that this might happen, you need to be aware of that. Um, and then the other thing is, and I think this is advice that I would give to people, I would say whatever you do, make sure you have um, a contingency put aside in advance, and a big one. Um, and not only putting aside a financial contingency for things like this, um, but also not to be surprised if you have to use it, plan to use it, um, especially if you're doing something unique or you've bought some land which needs a lot of work, for example, have a financial contingency in place and expect to use it. So when you say a big uh, contingency, what, what sort of, can you maybe quantify that percentage-wise? What would you say would be a safe sort of buffer? Um, I would say between 10 and 20%, depending on what your land is like. Yeah. Um, okay. If you're building on a nice flat piece of land, which is already plumbed in with all the services, etc., and it's a flat parcel, and you're building a kit home, basically, or, or, or something which is relatively simple, then I'm sure you could get away with, with, with you know, 5%, 10% even. Um, but, I mean, obviously everyone's financial situation is different, but the more money you can put aside for the contingency, this is not money that you have to spend, this is money that you might have to spend. And if you can kind of earmark that for the project, um, we're unlikely to use all of our contingency, and what we might do is release some of that. Um, as we sort of progress through the project and decide, you know what, we didn't use all of the contingency, maybe we can have the, you know, the, the nicer doors or the, you know, the, the, the flashy toilet with all the, you know, sirens and whistles and all that sort of thing on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily money that you are going to spend, but put aside as much as you can and be prepared to spend it, I would say. That sounds like excellent uh, risk mitigation strategy for anything. I think if you're, um, if you're not... Um... If you're tired of uh, teaching English at some point, there's probably call for you um, managing these sort of projects for foreigners that don't necessarily have the um, um, the Japanese counterpart or the language skills or the knowledge to deal with that. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's all I think once is probably enough. But okay. I appreciate the compliment. That's good money to be made, mate. Okay, so that, that's, I guess, that, that's probably one of the um, um, major cons in building as opposed to buying something that's already built. I mean, this need for contingency, right? If you're buying a, a land and a new home package from a developer, that that's there's not going to be too many surprises. I mean, it's basically um, what you are quoted is what you're going to pay. And when you're doing it on your own, then everything's on you, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess in, in your case, that's hopefully all that's gone not according to plan. So may, maybe not a huge setback um, in the grad scheme of things. So how are things progressing now? Where are you at? What's the roadmap from here on? Um, well, the, the land appears to be sort 
sorted. We have you know big steel pilings and you know horizontal pilings and a wall in place to, to sort of act as a retaining wall um, for you know the, the area of land that was not quite so so, so well shorn up. Um, so we are back on a regular but delayed building schedule now. Um, so you know things are back to sort of you know business as usual. I think you might say. Um, of course, we'll be we'll be a lot happier when we've made some more progress. I think, generally speaking, you know, once the frame is up, um, you feel a little bit happier about the whole pro- process. It's more likely that you're going to uncover sort of you know demons when it's when it's dealing with the land itself, because obviously you can't see what's under the ground. You don't know what it's going to be. Mm. Um, we're we're looking at perhaps September um, as a potential sort of finish date. Um, I think that's actually something that we. We underestimated, as, as, I, as I mentioned in the blog, it's, we, this has been an ongoing process for, for two, two and a half years now, and I hadn't quite realized at the start, when you decide to build a house, um, it is literally something you think about all the time. Um, you know, there is, there, is, there is not an hour goes past in the day where I'm not thinking about the house in some form or another. Hmm. Um, so as with all of these things, it's not so much the, the stress of the building itself, um, but it's the waiting. Um, and sort of the understanding, the feeling that this is going to have a pretty monumental impact on our lives. Um, I think my, my wife would hate me for saying this, but probably more so than getting married. No, I have heard about quite a few couples that have actually <laughs> ended up divorcing over building a house. You, you well, let, be... let's, let, let's hope that that doesn't happen. But no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's, it's the waiting that kills you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with any luck, we won't be waiting too much longer. Um, but, you know, this is, this is house building, you never know. Yeah. Things crossed. Okay, that, well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. I, I think that gives um, listeners and when we uh, do a transcript, probably readers as well, a really good insider's view of these types of projects, which a lot of people are interested in. So anyone you know, is considering buying their own place, but they're not really sure what exactly um, this kind of uh, uh, plan of building involves here in Japan, now have a better idea and maybe um, less of a fear factor um, and you know the freedom to explore that option. So Thank you again for sharing all of this with us. Um, if possible, we'd love to have you back here again once the work's all done and you've moved in or you're just about to move in. So maybe give us a wrap-up summary of the project and hopefully with a happy ending too. Um, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be delighted to come back on again. And uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you about the, the project and uh, hopefully providing some, some useful, at the very least, interesting information to the listeners. Oh, you have been. And on the blog too, folks, we're going to link to uh, the blog uh, in the show notes so you can read them um, all about um, the past, present, and uh, hopefully the future uh, progress of this project. Um, we're definitely going to bring Tom back here um, again. So that is probably it from us today. Thanks again, Tom. Thanks for uh, joining us. Thank you. And uh, folks, thanks for tuning in. Just to remind you, we're still think- taking your questions for the uh, Q&A sessions that we've just started. So any question or number of questions, as long as it's in audio or video format. So same topics you've been asking us about in writing, by email, in the comment sections, you can ask us about those, anything you've heard on the podcast, um, other topics that you'd like us to talk about at any point. And of course, you can also feel free to send in questions to the other people that you've been hearing from here. So interviewees like Tom, well, I'm sure we'll be happy to come back and answer those questions for you even before the project is done. Um, Duncan from the Japan Story blog, Kevin from JPI Crowdfunding, or anyone else that you've heard here. All it takes is just a minute of your recorded um, video or audio if you're too shy for video. And we promise to make you a worldwide internet success story overnight, or at least try to. So do, do leave us your comments or even better, a short review or just a star rating in the iTunes store or the podcast repository. We hope to have you again with us next time. And until then, from Tom and Yoko and Osaka and all of us here at NTI, we wish you, as always, a great day and happy investing.